1986, after having met Dr. Thaxton, I went off to grad school. I knew I wanted to work on this origin of life question. Thaxton had proposed in the epilogue of his book with his co-authors, Walter Bradley and Roger Olson, that <clears throat> perhaps what we were looking at in the living cell with the information and in DNA was uh, the product of, an, he called it, an intelligent cause. He said, because intuitively, information is a kind of, it's a mind-like product. It's something that comes from, from uh, that's what we know, he said, from experience. And so I began to wonder if this intuition, this intuitive connection between information and intelligence could be formulated as a rigorous scientific argument. And that, so that was my big animating question as I left for grad school. And I began to study the scientific methods and methods of reasoning that scientists use when they're investigating these questions about what happened in the remote past. In the, in the distant past, these origins questions. And so naturally, that led me to Darwin. And I learned that Darwin had a particular method of reasoning that is now called uh, the method of multiple competing hypotheses or the method of inference to the best explanation. And he said, in fact, in justifying his own theory, that he inferred his picture of the history of life as the best explanation, and he would hold it until a better explanation came along. But that raised a question, which was, well, what makes an explanation best? What makes an explanation best? And I came across an answer to that, not only in Darwin's work, where he uh, had a, a very specific criterion of best explanation, but also in the work of his scientific mentor, Charles Lyell, the great geologist. And I'll never forget the day that I was reading this boring Victorian subtitle to a dusty old book, and for me, the light bulb just went on. Here's, the, here's the, the, the book, Principles of Geology, now here's the, 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 the boring subtitle, being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. And I, I have to tell you, this hit me like a thunderbolt. I remember right where I was. Because he, what Lyell was saying is that if you're going to explain an event in the remote past, you shouldn't invoke a cause, the effects of which we do not know, you should invoke a cause, the effects of which we do know. You should invoke a cause that is presently acting or now operating, which has the power to produce the effect in question. The best explanation is by reference to a, is by reference to a cause that is known to produce what you're trying to explain. Simple example, Eastern Washington, where I went to college. There is now as of May 18th, 1980, a layer of ash out in the Palouse. Other stuff stacked on top of it, but you don't have to go very far down to find that layer of ash. What's the best, if you didn't know about the, the, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and you're just a geologist working through that, the, those layers, and you come across a layer of volcanic ash, what is the best explanation for what caused that? Possible hypotheses. Might have been a flood, might have been an earthquake, might have been a volcanic eruption. Which one is best? Well, obviously the volcanic eruption, but why? Because we have experience of volcanoes producing that effect, and we have no comparable experience of floods or earthquakes doing the same. So as you weigh those competing hypotheses, you elect the one that has the known causal powers, <clears throat> to use some jargon from the field, to produce the effect in question. And so when I began to think about the information question in light of the Darwinian methodology, the Lyellian principles of uniformitarian reasoning, I realized that using Darwin's own method of reasoning, we should come to a very different question, a conclusion about design. Why? Well, because there's something else we know about information. And there was an information scientist, and this was, in a sense, my second epiphany studying this. Information scientist Henry Quassler, early scientist in a pioneer in applying information theory and theoretical analysis to the, the molecular biology, to the genome. And offhand, not meaning to say anything about this big question of design in biology, he said the creation of information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Now think about that in light of of causes now in operation. In other words, what he's saying is the cause now in operation for the production of information is what? Intelligence, mind, conscious activity. And so I realized that by applying Darwin's 
key standard of best explanation, Lyell's principle of reasoning, to the information question, to the DNA enigma, there was a powerful rationale supporting the inference to intelligent design. Why? Because we know of only one cause that produces information. I knew from my study of origin of life research that chance, necessity, the combination of the two, and all the models that fell under those mutually exhaustive categories had failed. But there was a cause, there is a cause of which we know that is capable of producing information. And that cause is conscious activity, rational deliberation, intelligent design. And is this, is this consistent with our experience? Absolutely. If we go back to that computer code that Bill Gates was talking about, where does the, the, the information come from? It comes from intelligent agents. Now, I know some people have issues with word, and, but, you know, it's pretty, pretty impressive. We're in Redmond. Those are pretty smart people at Microsoft. You look at a newspaper headline or a hieroglyphic inscription or a radio signal embedding information in it, and you trace that information back to its source, you invariably come to, intelligence, to an intelligent cause, not a mindless, undirected process. So when we encounter information at the foundation of life in these information-bearing molecules, such as DNA and RNA and proteins, the most logical thing to conclude, based on our knowledge of cause and effect, based on our knowledge of causes now in operation, is that intelligence also played a role in the origin of the first life because life depends on information. If you look at any major invention, like the automobile, for example, the basic body design is set in place from the very beginning. You've got four wheels, a chassis, a drive shaft, two axles. There are certain basic features of all automobiles that have persisted since Ford and Benz got the whole thing going over a century ago. In the decades that followed the introduction of the automobile's basic framework, designers and engineers have created thousands of variations on the original theme. But regardless of differences in size, color, and chassis design, the foundational body plan remains consistent to its original form. And an interesting thing about the fossil record is that there's a similar top-down pattern evident in the history of life. The basic body plan of the arthropod phylum has a segmented torso, jointed legs, and an exoskeleton, all of which arose suddenly at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. And today we still see the continuity of this original plan, this foundational idea in over a million species of animals. How do these new animal body plans and fundamentally new forms of life come into existence? This was the mystery that Darwin set out to solve, but everything we've learned in biology over the last 50 years has brought this mystery back with a vengeance. How do you explain the origin of the Cambrian animals seemingly out of nowhere? This isn't just a problem of explaining the absence of evidence in the fossil record. It's also a problem of explaining everything we know about life right down to the level of molecules and cells. The biological structure of a Cambrian trilobite was as complex and sophisticated as a modern crab. Its organs included a brain, gut, heart, and compound eyes. Each organ was constructed from specific types of cells. Each cell type was made from dozens of specialized protein molecules. And each protein was assembled from a four-letter chemical code in a section of DNA called a gene. Now, for the evolutionary process to transform a simple pre-Cambrian organism like a sponge with four or five cell types into a Cambrian trilobite with at least 10 times that many different types of cells, that's a huge leap in complexity. And to make that leap, you need a vast amount of new genetic information. Where does that information come from? The paleobiologists have discovered little tiny microscopic sponge embryos in the layers of rock just beneath the layer that documents the Cambrian explosion. These embryos were soft-bodied animals, some fossilized 60 million years before the Cambrian explosion. They're eggs and embryos, which are preserved in thin crusts of mineralized material, a phosphatic material, on ancient seafloors, which suggests that the chemistry of the seawater in those days was somewhat different than it is today, because this method of preserving fossils disappears during the Cambrian. And 
it's not around today. So we're lucky that we have these thin crusts with little tiny fossils in them. This is highly significant because one of the most popular explanations for the missing Precambrian fossils is that the Precambrian animals were too soft and too small to have been preserved. Since 1999, Paul Chien has studied fossil embryos and helped develop techniques to analyze their structure. By treating with acid, you can actually remove the rock and isolate the embryos, and then you get um, around pebble-like or sand grain-like samples. And, and then uh, we look through some tiny little ones, uh, larger ones up to one millimeter in size. And we found about the range between 500 and 800 micrometers. We have mostly sponge. And then uh, I start breaking up these balls and, and try to uh, start looking inside. And with the help of the electron microscope, I was able to see the detailed subcell structure within these embryos. Jen's work on these fragile remnants of Precambrian life raises an important question. If these lower strata can preserve an embryo, if they can preserve a soft microscopic embryo, then why couldn't they have preserved the larger ancestral forms that supposedly evolved into the Cambrian animals? In other words, if you can preserve something as fragile as an embryo, why couldn't you, in the same strata of rock, preserve the immediate ancestor of a hard-shelled trilobite? So the idea that the fossil record is too damaged to provide us with at least a general picture, uh, that idea just doesn't wash.